So welcome everyone to today's webinar, A Framework to Approach Racial Health Inequities During the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Duje, a member of the section on Minority Health Equity and Inclusion, and I will be introducing um, today's slide as well as today's speaker, Dr. Rhea Boyd. So the section on Minority Health Equity and, Con and Inclusion is sponsoring um, today's webinar. The section on Minority Health Equity and Inclusion brings you this information today out of a recognition of the disparate impact COVID has had on black and brown communities. We expect this webinar will serve as the beginning of the conversation and we have members that are committed to continuing this work. Please consider, consider joining the section to join, to join in this and other important work. So both speakers, myself and Dr. Boyd have no conflicts no conflict of interest um, to disclose for today's webinar. And we do not intend to discuss any unapproved investigative use of a commercial product device in the presentation. So again, introducing ourselves as the speakers, I'm Dr. Jacqueline Duje. I'm the speaker, I'm the person on the left-hand side and our speaker, today's webinar speaker is Dr. Rhea Boyd, she is on the right. So why is this discussion important? The issue of addressing racial health inequities during the COVID-19 is important because the pandemic further brings to light the existing racial and structural inequities in the United States. National and state data show African Americans and people with lower incomes are disproportionately represented in COVID-19 cases and deaths. There have also been increased incidents of racism and xenophobia, especially towards our Asian American um, community. This, this also highlights the unequal access to education health and economic and social supports that many children and families need. Despite the negative data, this pandemic provides us as health care providers and leaders with opportunities to advocate to address policies and structures that have perpetuated and led to racial inequities. If we don't address these inequities now, when will they ever be addressed? The objectives for today's webinar are to discuss emerging health disparities, data in the COVID-19 pandemic, how the COVID-19 pandemic exemplifies ongoing structural inequities and racism and what pediatricians can do to help. Today's speaker is Dr. Rhea Boyd. Dr. Boyd is a pediatrician and child and community health advocate who works to address the impacts of racism on health and healthcare through community partnerships, teaching and writing. Today she will discuss racial health disparities within the COVID-19 pandemic. But please note that these issues are far too complex to address exhaustively in a 15 minute webinar Rather, it is intended to start the conversation or get people thinking about why this is important and, and what they can do. The section on minority health, equity, and inclusion plans to continue the conversation and again encourages people to continue it on the AAP COVID-19 discussion boards. For further questions, e please email COVID-19 at AAP.org. Alarming reports from across the country evidence striking racial inequities in the population level distribution of infections and deaths related to the COVID-19 pandemic. While preliminary, these data reveal a pattern that is disturbing, but it's also a pattern that reflects broader racial health inequities in the U.S. Because of that, for some, these findings may be familiar and perhaps even, quote, unsurprising, as some public officials have described them. But as we examine these racial health inequities, it's critical to note that although the patterns are familiar, they are never normal and should not exist. So today we will close with how we can address them. Also, while most of the available data on inequities is for adults, the data reflect the unequal burdens borne by African-American, Latinx, Indigenous, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander households and families that will both directly and indirectly impact the health and well being of children and youth. Looking nationally at the CDC data available by race or ethnicity, stark inequities emerge for African American, Asian, and Latinx populations who have disproportionately higher rates of death related to COVID 19 than their proportion of the general population. As we look closer at some of the cities and states reporting the largest racial health inequities, the findings are most stark for African Americans, so we will have a particular focus on those populations today. But note, the existing data is incomplete, as racial and ethnic data is missing in more than 50% of cases that are federally reported. 
Currently, only 26 states are reporting COVID deaths by race and ethnicity, and only two are reporting testing by race and ethnicity. That means we have yet to appreciate the full scope of potential racial inequities because data remains unavailable for certain counties, states, and populations, which may reflect limitations in testing, access to care, or other reporting deficiencies. With that in mind, let's get started. The U.S. epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic is New York, and most specifically, New York City. Looking closer at New York City, we see African Americans and Latinx populations have the highest rates of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Moving to the Midwest, we see that Chicago is the epicenter of the pandemic in Illinois, followed by St. Louis. And that despite being only 30% of the population, African Americans represent 50% of COVID related deaths, which is the highest death rate of any group in the city. These startling disparities are similar in places like Washington DC, where African Americans make up 79% of total deaths, and states like Michigan, Louisiana, Wisconsin, and California, where we also see a disproportionate impact on Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations. These populations are also disproportionately impacted in areas in Utah, Washington, and Oregon. Looking specifically at the Indian Health Service data, we see the highest case count among Navajo Nation. Overall, national county level data reveal the COVID-19 death rate is six times higher for those who live in areas that are predominantly non-white as compared to those in areas that are predominantly white. This is particularly true for majority black counties as reported in the Washington Post. Inaccurate and hateful rhetoric referring to COVID-19 has contributed to a spike in anti-Asian hate crimes that while not direct infections, nonetheless affect the physical and mental health of populations of Asian descent during this pandemic. Taken together, we're now going to explore the extent to which the racial health disparities we've just outlined reflect health inequities or population level differences in health that are avoidable, unnecessary, unfair, and ultimately unjust. Health inequities arise when populations are made vulnerable to illness or disease by practices, policies, or laws or norms that inequitably distribute protections to prevent people from getting sick and supports to ameliorate sickness and address the social, economic, and physical consequences of being ill. To better understand the racial health inequities emerging amid the COVID-19 pandemic, let's explore four conditions that shape or structure who gets sick and who gets well. Those conditions include the inequitable risk of exposure, the inequitable risk of infection and complications, the inequitable distribution of protections, and the inequitable distribution of, of supports. Here, I place an asterisk next to the word risk to remind us that instead of thinking at the individual level where quote unquote risky behaviors could potentially contribute to illness or disease, we are thinking at the population level to identify factors that systematically disadvantage certain racial and ethnic groups over others. So let's jump in. COVID-19 is primarily transmitted through droplets that can infect humans directly from an affected human or indirectly through contaminated surfaces. Exposure to affected humans or contaminated surfaces is higher for essential workers, those who lack paid sick leave, and those who live, work, learn, or play in close proximity to others. Across the US, African American and Latinx populations, particularly women, disproportionately work in industries that require sustained public contact during COVID-19. African American, Latinx, and indigenous populations also have disproportionately less access to paid sick leave because they garner lower wages and predominantly live in states that fail to mandate such protections. Legacies of segregation and suburbanization mean African American and Latinx populations may also disproportionately reside in multi generational dwellings or dense urban areas where proximity between people increases risks for exposure. 
African American, Latinx, and Indigenous populations are also overrepresented among the homeless, the incarcerated, and detained populations, which confines people in crowded facilities that also increase risks for exposure. COVID-19 infection and its complications are also inequitably distributed among racial and ethnic populations in the U.S. And while African American, Latinx, and Indigenous populations may have higher rates of underlying illness, those inequities are driven by forms of racism and discrimination that have intergenerational consequences. For example, Long-term exposure to air pollution has been associated with an increase in COVID-19 mortality rates. But segregation, white flight, and zoning ordinances profoundly shape African Americans' exposure to air pollution, which may also increase their COVID-19 related mortality. It's factors like these that are why African Americans are more likely to die early from all causes. Thus, the preconditions that render certain racial and ethnic populations vulnerable to COVID-19 are not simply summarized with terms like poverty or underlying illness. Instead, they reveal legacies and current practices of racial exclusion, discrimination, disinvestment, and violence that concentrate disadvantage, create adversity, shape population level opportunities for health, and provide conditions for disease by racial or ethnic groupings. When we conflate the potent effects of racism and xenophobia with the effects of poverty on COVID-19 inequities, we ignore how racial discrimination, exclusion, and violence impacts racial and ethnic populations independent of their income or wealth. Doing so also inaccurately assumes that all those who are disproportionately affected are poor. Now let's review how protections have been inequitably distributed, leaving certain racial and ethnic groups more vulnerable to illness. Hand washing is one of the most important ways to limit the spread of infectious disease, but race, not income, is the single greatest predictor of access to clean water in the US. Thus, African-American and Latinx populations are about twice as likely to lack access to clean water in their homes as white households. And Native Americans are 19 times more likely to lack access to clean water in their homes than white households. When you consider how the distribution of clean water impacts exposure and infection risk, you begin to see how structural racism, in this case, operating through segregation and disinvestment, shapes the distribution of COVID-19 in the US. In addition, in the face of a nationwide shortage of masks, many essential workers have been left without adequate protections, increasing risks for preventable exposures among these groups. Also, disproportionately affected racial and ethnic groups may be more likely to live in settings in which effective isolation for affected individuals is simply not possible. Populations like African Americans, Latinx, and indigenous households also disproportionately live in states that were slow to issue stay at home or shelter in place orders. These are also the states beginning to reopen, despite the nearly assured risk doing so poses to those populations. Finally, let's explore how supports to combat or buffer the effects of COVID-19 are inequitably distributed among racial and ethnic groups in the US. First, Latinx and indigenous populations have the lowest rates of insurance coverage. Second, African Americans predominantly live in states that failed to expand Medicaid. Together, these factors significantly limit access to healthcare services and increase the risk of untreated underlying illness among African American, Latinx, and indigenous populations. Despite increasing test capacity nationwide, the distribution of tests available to African American, Latinx, and indigenous populations may be limited by provider discretion, patient insurance status, or local capacity. This may impede efforts to contain spread in those affected communities. COVID-19 has also disrupted primary care access for preventative services, like vaccinations and chronic care management. 
which may increase the risk for other communicable illness and worsen chronic disease among populations disproportionately burdened by inadequate access to primary care in the first place. COVID-19 related shortages of medications that treat diseases like lupus will also disproportionately harm women of color, particularly black women who could suffer complications as a result. African-American, indigenous, and Latinx populations suffer the highest rates of police harassment and violence, and selective punitive policing of these groups during the pandemic through disproportionate fines or arrests may contribute to the physical, mental, and economic toll COVID-19 is already taking on these populations. Federal relief efforts to support cities and individuals economically impacted by COVID-19 currently exclude some small cities that have predominantly Black populations and mixed status families that are deemed ineligible for support. This effectively excludes those, those communities from supports meant to buffer the devastating effects COVID-19 has on our economy. And despite racist and xenophobic violence that has risen in the wake of COVID-19, federal agencies have yet to announce plans to protect and support those affected. So what can we do? Number one, to better understand who is affected and how, including the direct and collateral consequences the pandemic has on children and youth, it's critical to capture the rich interactions between demographics like race and ethnicity and age, place, gender, and education or income status. Doing so allows us to trace the mechanisms through which racism can render or make certain racial or ethnic populations more vulnerable than others. It also enables us to prioritize resources for those most affected. Number two, closing coverage gaps that contribute to racial health inequities will also help ensure all children receive the medical care they need. Because when parents and caregivers are covered and cared for, it enables them to care for their families and it increases the healthcare utilization of their children. Number three, we must push for equitable relief packages that prioritize the families most affected and those with the least resources. Number four, continuing primary care will be essential to prevent the reemergence of vaccine preventable disease and the exacerbation of chronic illness for children and adults. Number five, while universal testing is ideal, in the setting of limited capacity, testing must prioritize populations made most vulnerable. Number six, the sacrifice essential workers are making requires an equal sacrifice on our part to protect them with living wages, paid sick leave, and protective equipment. Number seven, the economic toll of COVID-19 is already enormous. Ensuring affordable housing that is safe from pollution will be critical to mitigating future health problems. Number eight, Championing anti-racism is critical to support Asian communities affected by racist violence. Number nine, the mental health toll from COVID-19 will be unique and profound for children broadly and African-American, Latinx, Indigenous, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations in particular. Number 10, as we prepare for potential recirculation of the virus, we must address the root drivers of racial health inequities now. Number 11, doing so will enable us to finally address long-term solutions to structural racism. In the face of big endemic enduring problems like racism in the US, it's so easy to keep kicking the can down the road and avoiding the work we have to do to unravel our dependence on racism as a political economy and as a healthcare system. But every Band-Aid we put on top of that essential dependence further entrenches the problem and sometimes keeps it out of our view. So to address racial inequities in COVID and beyond, we must consider how to universally distribute supports and protections to those most in need. But we also must work to eliminate the racial ordering of medical resources by ending segregation, residentially and in our workforce. For folks who are interested in getting started, please go to federaladvocacyaap.org or visit www.aap.org slash COVID-19 for ways to get started with your AAP colleagues.
For questions on today's presentation, please email covid19 at aap.org.